My name is Bradley Wojtek. I'm a professor in cognitive science and data science here at UC San Diego in the Haligio Lu Data Science Institute. And I run a research lab uh, at the intersection of neuroscience and data science. So I try and use huge amounts of data to understand how the different parts of the brain talk to each other. What is data science? You know, if you ask uh, 20 data scientists, you're gonna get 20 different answers. It's that kind of thing, right? I, I have a very strong biased opinion about what data science is. And to me, data science is taking advantage, it's a, it's a way of taking advantage of the huge amounts of what we call unstructured data. So it's not like people running an experiment and carefully recording every single number. Unstructured data is just the data that are being generated around us all the time. Or you carry a phone in your pocket, uh, you know, you order some dinner, uh, you write some comments on, you know, Facebook or, you know, uh, something like that. And that's information that can be leveraged by companies uh, to usually sell you something, right? And so that unstructured data is just stuff that we create nonstop around us. Um, on the science side, we create unstructured data all the time. Uh, and so for me, data science is taking all of these huge amounts of data that have been collected by tens of thousands of scientists all around the world across decades of research and bringing it all together in a way that allows us to make sense of the world around us. So data science, in short, is taking this huge amounts of data, figuring out a way of bringing it together to allow us to answer questions by using programming and mathematical and statistical models to understand the world. Data science is relevant now because of the amount of data that are being generated. Uh, the reason it has shown up in the world when it has is because computing is ubiquitous. It's everywhere, right? We've all got these phones and computers and there's computers in everything, right? And once you have all of this digital information being generated uh, and it's cheap enough to store, once it's all sitting around, the next thing then is for, is for people to say, hey, can we do something with all of this data? Uh, and so uh, it's no accident that data science has risen at the same time as everybody having personal computers, everybody having smartphones, uh, or nearly everybody, I should say, right? At least in, in uh, some parts of the world. And um, social media and all of these things being uh, arising at the same time. And that is why data science now exists, is because of the ubiquity of computing and social media and all of these kinds of similarly related technologies. Data science isn't just something that applies to people working in technology and in, in traditionally technological fields, right? Um, for good or for ill, every domain is becoming increasingly technology focused and based. Imagine, I don't know, uh, you know, I'm sitting here in front of a camera right now. Imagine working in arts and film. You think about something like any Marvel movie or Disney film being created right now, the huge amounts of technology that go into creating that and motion capture in order to, uh, uh, you know, for people who aren't familiar, motion capture, you put somebody in a bodysuit that has what are called fiducial markers, little uh, points on the, on the body that the cameras can easily see so that you can trace exactly which part of the body is where in X, Y, Z, or as a complement to that, uh, you could digitize all of the text of all of these books written in different languages uh, by taking photos of the books and then turn those photos into text and then use automated uh, algorithmic machine translation. So you, you translate text uh, into a common uh, language like English and then you can do statistical analyses across every book written that you've digitized. So instead of having to sit down and read these books and try and get a general sense, a gist, uh, uh, you know, do this, this it's, it's delicate, detailed, very difficult scholarship that can take years to do. As a complement to that, you can also do these kinds of analyses and say, are there statistical trends in the way that people talk about the, the Roman Empire and uh, you know, the, the language that they use when talking about its rulers over the centuries and millennia, something like that. You could do that kind of statistical data-driven analysis of just about any domain as a complement to traditional scholarship as well. So it touches upon all of these different fields, arts, humanities, natural sciences, and so on. 
I'm not sure if we have gotten to the point where data science has truly leveled the playing field. I'd like to think that here at UC San Diego, we are trying to help level that playing field, giving more people access to more information in a ethical manner that preserves privacy and dignity of individual people. Uh, and that's difficult to do because so much data is being generated and uh, you know data leaks and hacks uh, might release information that we don't want released about ourselves. Um, but that said, uh, the, the amount of data that are being generated that are freely available does allow anybody to gather those data in a way and analyze them to find new things. And so in some sense, there is the possibility for anybody to become a scientist, a data scientist. Now, whether or not that possibility is being realized yet is a different question. And so, you know, many of the efforts that we're doing here at UC San Diego and you know, are trying to allow for people around the world to have that kind of access, for people to become scientists, to run interesting projects and be creative in the way that they think about using data to analyze questions that are important for uh, either broader humanity or you know, at the local level, um, even during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we ran our graduation ceremony yesterday and one of the awards for our undergraduate uh, data science students who just graduated was somebody who would run a project leveraging data about uh, coronavirus outbreaks uh, on campus and in San Diego in general uh, to try and build models to predict where new outbreaks might occur. Uh, and so you have these leveraging data to do important work at the local level to help individual people, right? And then you also have data science to uh, leverage huge amounts of data to understand the worldwide spread of outbreaks and pandemics and things like that, right? So it truly is something that spans so many different domains and at so many different levels. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to do good. And our job as professors is, is to try and make sure that we teach people, uh, you know, and hopefully teach them how to do good uh, while being mindful of the possibility for you know, the dangers of so much data. I think one of the main barriers for people doing data science, well, one is time, right? We're also busy, especially during the pandemic, right? Uh, the idea of trying to learn a new set of skills, if I'm not a data scientist getting paid to do it, uh, the idea of trying to sit down, you know, after I've like gotten my kids, you know, dinner made and, you know, uh, you know, bathed and cleaned, and then I've got to, you know, get them to bed. And then I'm going to use that like last hour before I go to bed to try and learn something new. Time, I think, is a fundamental barrier. Um, and people are overworked and stressed right now. Uh, and it's not a lack of access to information, I don't think, right? UC San Diego and uh, many other universities have these online courses, free materials that are out there. When, you know, the classes that we teach here in data science, a lot of the materials you can just access online. You can go right now and find them. So the ability is out there. Uh, the information, the ability to learn, the data if you want to run your own projects, all of that exists. I think the barrier is time and also um, I think it's intimidating. Uh, for people who aren't, maybe they think they're, they're not, you know, you hear this all the time, I'm not a math person, right? And so uh, the kinds of math and programming uh, for a lot of people are very intimidating. And uh, I think having a undergraduate curriculum at universities that demystifies data and data science and programming is important. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've, uh, we've argued that digital literacy should be a fundamental aspect of undergraduate general education, regardless of what your major degree is, right? If you are in the you know, computer sciences, uh, uh, natural sciences, or in the arts and humanities and social sciences, right? It seems like understanding what kinds of data, data we are generating and that are being generated in the world about us and how those data are being used for us and potentially against us is something that should be a fundamental aspect of everybody's education. And so uh, I think just with time and familiarity, uh, these data-driven approaches to understanding the world are gonna become more common and less maybe scary uh, to people. I'm genuinely very excited about seeing the kinds of creative things that people are able to do or our students here are able to do with data, right? I, I begin uh, inevitably when I'm teaching these classes and I say, what you should do is a project, do a data-driven project. And then of course the natural response from students back to that is, well, how do I get started? What do I do? And uh, 
you know, then it's a brainstorming process. And I'm excited about what comes out of these brainstorming ideas. I say, begin with something you care about, that you love, that you're interested in. Is it uh, food, sports, uh, politics, social justice, dance, music? Doesn't matter, just start with something and pick something, right? And so let's say it's food. How many recipe websites are out there that you could go to those websites, write some code to scrape the data out of those websites to find what ingredients are commonly used together? You know, uh, what are the most common ingredients used across different food types, right? So you can start with something like food. I love food, I love cooking. Okay, what kind of data might exist about food out there? Recipe websites, everywhere. And those recipe websites have ingredients and they tell you the amounts and they tell you what's in them. And once you have that, you can then say, show me uh, what are the most common foods that exist across all food types. People have done this, right? And garlic is the universal food. Just about every culture on earth, every kind of cuisine, uses garlic. Garlic is the universal spice, right? Um, and olive oil, also a very common thing. Tomatoes, a very common thing. And then what are the, what are the ingredients, what are the spices, uh, what are the food types that are unique to different cultures that aren't commonly used? And now once you start to think about uh, quantifying what seems unquantifiable, food, right? You can quantify what are the most unique ingredient combinations in different cultures. Now you can start to do statistical analyses and figure out ways of using data science to algorithmically generate potentially new recipes for you, right? Um, give me a recipe that uses garlic and uh, some unique combination of spices that are not commonly found in California cuisine. You could do that. You could write code to do that using openly available data uh, right now. And those kinds of things I'm excited about. So there's just so much possibility for, for fun and creativity, for creating new things, right? It's the idea that you could use existing data to bolster your creative thinking to me is just mind boggling and amazing. And so to me, that's what gets me most excited about the data science way of approaching things. There are a couple of different challenges to accessing information. One is there are some data sets that exist for certain that of course we can't access because they're proprietary, right? Uh, Facebook, for example, is sitting on just the world's largest treasure trove of information about human behavior, right? We go onto Facebook and we write our thoughts and our feelings. We upload photos of ourselves and our families in our most joyful and painful moments. Right? And so if you are a social scientist that wants to understand how people respond to each other during times of joy or grief, Facebook has those data at a scale that you can't do in an experimental situation in a lab. That's more open and honest, right? If I bring people into a laboratory and have them sit down and I have them have a conversation and talk about their feelings of grief, if I'm a, you know, a psychologist trying to understand and help somebody process uh, what they're going through and celebrate their joys, if we're doing it in a setting that's in a lab uh, or in a, in a you know, psychiatrist or psychologist's office, uh, that's different. It sets people up to be a little bit more careful in what they say and they do. Whereas on Facebook, they'll freely share their comments and their feelings and you know, their family responds to them and they, they, they you know, share those joys and moments with them uh, in a way that is difficult to recreate artificially in a lab setting. But you know, obviously for, for a variety of reasons, privacy uh, as well as, as just uh, proprietary data collection, Facebook, uh, you know, they, they usually don't share those kinds of data with people. So one is there, there are data that exists out there that are difficult to obtain. As a researcher, I might be able to appeal to Facebook and ask them you know, if I could uh, collaborate with them on a project. So it's not impossible. It's just, you know, it's not like anybody can do it. If I'm, you know, a PhD holding professor at a university, I might be able to do it, um, you know, but uh, yeah, I'm helping run these online uh, educational tutorials for neuroscience and data science uh, this summer, uh, something called the Neuromatch Academy. You know, and we've got students in, you know, all over the world. And a student in Nigeria wants to, you know, access these Facebook data, Facebook might be less likely than a tenured professor at a major research university, right? Um, Another one is, uh, there's a phrase I love called malicious compliance. So you can uh, ask for data, uh, you can ask for information, like Freedom of Information Act kinds of requests, uh, say from the United States government, and they will give you uh, that information, but it might be in a format that is very difficult for you to um, statistically, digitally analyze. Imagine a company 
uh, is getting sued, class action lawsuit. And uh, they have to give over all of the email records from the executives in the company written over the last you know, several 20 years or something like that. They have to do that by court order. And so what they might do is take all of those emails, print them out, and then hand over stacks of printed emails because technically they are complying with the request, but you can't very easily digitally search through those decades of emails and you know, hundreds of thousands of printed out pages. And so that's another, another sort of uh, difficulty that can arise if you want to analyze data. And now malicious compliance implies intent, it's malicious, right? But there's also just poor data practices where you know, their data exists, but it's very difficult for you as an individual person to collect and analyze, right? And so there are certain places like sports are very good at uh, taking everything and giving statistical information about it, right? And so you, you know, if you watch baseball, the Padres in San Diego are, are doing very well right now, and somebody will come up to bat and they'll hit a home run, and you'll hear something like, oh, that's the first home run that's been hit on an opening day you know, on, uh, you know, during a rainy day game against an opponent in the National League uh, East, you know, and you're like, well, how? That's, a, that's very specific, right? Sports are notorious for having huge amounts of data that uh, some of which you can access as, you know, an individual person, but some of it can be very difficult to obtain, right? Uh, and you could do the labor of reviewing old films and highlight reels of individual sports, and then you could manually or maybe with some algorithmic support, uh, digitize those data for statistical analyses, but some of it is just very difficult to get a hand, uh, get a hand on. So there is the um, proprietary data makes it difficult, and also some data you know exists, they're out there. You could get them with a lot of hard manual work, but it's just so overwhelming to do. So those are the two main hurdles in, in my off-the-cuff opinion right now. <laughs>
How does that work? And that's what my lab is interested in. This is, I think, one of the most exciting papers that, that takes the data science ethos uh, from the beginning uh, and then finds all these open data sets to try and leverage. And so actually, uh, so much so, because uh, my lab had been talking about this approach for years and finally we started doing it, I now created an undergraduate class that I taught for the first time here at UC San Diego called Neural Data Science that teaches undergraduate students how to do this. And so what to me is amazing about what we're building here at UC San Diego in this Collegiola Data Science Institute is that we have this research project that is cutting edge, very few people, only uh, you know a handful of research labs in the world are doing this kind of work. And six months later, I can teach a class to undergraduates and they're doing that same kind of thing. Right? And I, I think that's an, an amazing thing where now this cutting edge research that only a couple labs in the world are doing, I taught a class to 30 undergraduates and they did a final project that not the same degree, but of the same kind of work. And they're gonna come out of undergraduate thinking this is a totally normal way of approaching science. Right? And I love that amazingly rapid turnaround with our data science program here. In order to be a good steward of data and data science, you have to be honest with yourself and with everyone else. Honest with yourself in admitting the limitations of approaches, purely data-driven approaches, right? Um, there is a, in the, in, in the social sciences and the sciences, we have this distinction between qualitative data and quantitative data. Quantitative data are, like I said, it's measuring the you know, mass of water in a jar and how that might change over time with evaporation. Qualitative data would be interviewing somebody to see how did this policy, this law change, this event in the world impact your life? Now, I think what is going to happen is that as the data science ascendancy continues, the distinction between qualitative and quantitative data will begin to dissolve. Qualitative data are just data we haven't figured out how to quantify yet. If I can sit down and have an interview with you and a dozen other people about the impact that some legislative policy has on your life and using my expertise, distill that information out in a way that I can say, here are the common threads, the narrative threads of how this imp is impacting people's lives. Why can't I create an algorithm that quantifies that? In theory, I should be able to. In order to be good stewards of data, you have to listen to the experts who are doing those kinds of interviews and work with them to figure out, am I doing this right? Don't just go in the room guns blazing saying, I got this because I know math, right? You have to say, Let's listen to the people that are doing the work and let's listen and hear and say, and accept their feedback. And if they say, you can't just turn this into an algorithm, I can push back and say, well, I think I can. Other people might already be doing so. So how can we ensure that if that is going to happen, how do we ensure that it's being done with you at the table as a non-data scientist to make sure that at least we are going in the right direction and you are there to tell us when our algorithms go awry, when our data analyses are flawed, and when our conclusions seem to contradict your expertise, right? Because then that means we either need new data from different perspectives or new algorithms and ways of analyzing them.